Mm. Now, I said before, I want to address this book here. And there's a, there's a vid out there. I think the vid is from um, uh, Bobby um, Hemet. And he touches on the Gnostics. It's, it's one of his vids. And I think it's on the YouTube. So I, I saw it in parts, but it might be out there in the full. But it's on, look at Bobby Hemet and Gnostic, either Gnostic Gospels or Gnostics. And you probably will link with that particular video or that series of videos. It's a video I highly, highly recommend for the brothers and sisters to, um, to check that particular video. Check that particular video out. It gives some good... Um, references and some good background material that I think is very useful. But he, he points to this particular book right here. I don't know if you can find a copy of it or you might be able to find some of it online. But we're just going to touch on one particular one particular um, um, epistle, the Potome's Epistle to Flora, right? And it is this right here. Here we go, right there. This is what we want to touch on right here because it's a connection with the law, and there's a very good explanation that's given here that in our studies we found this to be very, um, very uh, illuminating. Let's say it like that. So here we have Potomac's Epistle to Flora. Now it connects with the tripartite nature of the Ten Commandments and those who have the Schofield Study Bible, if you go to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, there's a footnote right here. Let's see if we can show you this footnote right here. There's a footnote right there that basically speaks of the same thing, the tripartite nature of the commandment, that the commandment is in three parts of what's known as the, quote, commandments or the law, generally speaking as the law. Sometimes it's also used to refer to Torah, because Torah also means, uh, said to mean law, but more correctly it means instruction. The Torah is the instruction. But well, let's just go over this right here, this, this small part. We went over it before, but we have to go over it again. And there's a footnote further down here, too, that states that there is a threefold giving of the law right down here. You see where it says there's a threefold giving of the law, right? There's a three part fold giving of the law. Now we have this as a PDF at our website. You can download it for free. I think it's on our studies page and there's a lot of other materials as well. So you can use it on your computer or your mobile device or your reader or whatever like that. You can use it there. Um I wouldn't suggest to print it out because there's like um there's like some thousands of pages. But if you want to order a copy of, this is like the old Schofield Study Bible. We find it to be much more useful, in a sense, especially for the Brotherhood Studies, than some of the new versions of the Schofield Study Bible, which uses the new King James text, which is also useful, but at the first level, at the beginner's level, the old versions. So like we said, we have the PDF at our website. You can download it for free, www.lojsociety.org. So take advantage of that if you can. Um, but now the Mosaic Covenant, what's known as the, quote, Mosaic Covenant, first it was given to Israel. Secondly, it was in three divisions, each essential to the others. So each portion, each of the three, a threefold cord is not quickly broken, each of the three, and what's implied here is Selassie, is Seleus, is Selassie, or is the Trinity. So it was given to Israel, it was in three divisions, each essential to the others, together it was form, forming the Mosaic Covenant vis-a-vis -vis the commandments, one, expressing the righteous will of God, Exodus 20 verses 1 to 26, then the judgments which govern the social life of Israel, chapter 21, um, verse 1 to chapter 24, verse 11. And this is what covers uh, Mishpatim, which is the 18th um, Torah portion and the 18th Sabbath house reading, which is this present seven-day reading and feeding and teaching. Then 
So the second part is the judgment. The first part is the commandment, you understand, expressing the righteous will of God. The second part is the judgment. And the third part is the ordinances, what's known as the ordinances governing the religious life of Israel, Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 to Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. It says, these three elements form what's known as the, quote, law, as that phrase is gen generically used in the New Testament. For example, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Now, the commandments and the ordinances formed one religious system. So the commandments and the ordinances form what's known as one religious system, a religious system. The commandments were a, quote, ministry of condemnation, end quote, and of, quote, death, end quote, according to Second Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. The ordinances gave in the high priest. So now the ordinances, which were over the religious life, they had gave in the high priest, the uh, Kahinite, a representative of the people with Jehovah, a representative of the people with Yahweh. Now, Hebrews informs us and verifies that Yeshua HaMoshiach is our high priest. So our high priest is Yeshua HaMoshiach, even and especially for us as elect Rastafari. You understand? Know um, his majesty is our God Father, is Abba Kedus. But Jesus Christos is Lika Kahenat. He is the Kahen Ha Godol, Yeshua Ha Moshiach. He is our high priest. And Hebrews is, is, it will give you further information and verification and documentation of that. Now, the ordinances gave in the high priest a representative of the people with Yahweh, and in the sacrifices a cover. They were kidan, a cover. You understand that? When we say kippur, kippur, yom kippur, a cover. And see atonement, Leviticus chapter 16 and 6, and there's a, there's a Schofield note there. For their sins, in anticipation of the mezcal, in anticipation of the cross, in anticipation of the cross of Yeshua, you understand, of his, of his cross, Hebrews chapter Five verses one to three, Hebrews chapter nine, verses six to nine, Romans chapter three, verses twenty five and twenty six. Now the Christian or the true Meshahawian, the Messiahite or the or the Christian is not under the conditional Mosaic covenant of works, the law, but is but under the unconditional new covenant of grace. Now, we're not under the law, but we are in the law through being born again, you understand, being born again and becoming sons and daughters through our big brother, Yeshua HaMoshiach, to the God, to his God, and to his Father. We are in laws now. So now we are given the grace you understand, we're giving the grace in and through the faith or on the faith of Yeshua to be that living law. You understand? So the law is still our schoolmaster and the law is still in effect, but there's a lot of misunderstanding concerning this. And hopefully by touching on, um, touching on the Potome's epistle to Flora, will give us some more of that background um, information. Now, further, there's another note here. Um, there is a threefold giving of the law. First, it was given orally. It was given, it was, it was spoken. You understand? It was the opening of the mouth. It was spoken in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. Now, this was pure law. Even the Schofield note, notes that it was pure law with no provision. It had originally what was given as an oral law. It had no provision of priesthood and sacrifice for failure and was accompanied by, it was accompanied by the judgments. And this is what we have in this week's portion. So last week, 17, was the giving of that pure law, which had no provision of priesthood. It had no provision of sacrifice for failure. So the sacrifice 
the institution of sacrifice was for the failure to keep the pure law. So we need to we need to meditate and understand that. And it was accompanied by judgments. So even though we have we're studying this in these two Sabbaths, uh, this Sabbath the 18th, last Sabbath the 17th, but we learned these are these are these were accompanied. These were together. They related to the relations of Hebrew of Hebrew with Hebrew. Like when we say with brethren, brother with brother, Wendem with Wendem. We would say Wendem with Wendem, brother with brother, Hebrew with Hebrew. You understand? Um, Rastafari with Rastafari, if you please. This is what it speaks of, to which were added in Exodus chapter 23, 14 to 19, directions. So that now to this, there were directions for keeping of three annual feasts. That means every year, and for every orbit, complete orbit of what's known 360, 65 days, there are three annual, three. So notice the use of three, too, or the Trinity, or Selassie. And Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 to 33, instructions for the conquest of the Canaan. Then lastly, but not leastly, they were given instructions for conquering the promised land. And see, these are the sort of instructions that we need as well. You understand? Know because our promised land is Africa. Africa is there, Ethiopia. But it must be conquered. Because, you see, like the Israelites, we've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And that wandering in the wilderness, others, you understand, have taken over you understand? Strangers and others are on our land, or are in our land. You understand? And we're speaking of we're speaking of Africa. You understand? This we're speaking of the African Zion. We're speaking of of uh, Tobia or Ethiopia. We're speaking of Shashimeni even. Now this is beautiful because we, we, when we study this, we now see the the order. The Sir'at, the Shir'at of Yahweh. We see the Shina Sir'at. We see the order, the ordinance. You understand? So we can come out of this chaos, Babylon. You see, Babylon is confusion. But in order to come out of Babylon, you must come to order. You know, law and order. So law and order are very important themes for us. Because, see, when we are in and keeping our own law and order, then we are not under judgment of the Gentiles as we have suffered for 400 plus years and still as a people, you understand, as a lost sheep, still suffer their unjust laws and orders which have perverted greatly the real message of the Bible, even though they make people swear on the Bible, but Christ says not to swear. These words Moses communicated to the people, Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 to 8. Immediately in the person of the elders or the Shemagali which remember in Revelation chapter 5, we have the elders. And of the elders is one elder that said, said Nahu, Moan Besazem Negedi Yehuda. And the good is, he said, Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the, the, the seven seals, the seals thereof. So immediately, what the Yahweh in the person of, this, of their Shemagalewoch or Shemagalewochacho, their elders, they were admitted to the fellowship of God. They were admitted to the brotherhood of God, the brotherhood, the Wendamamachne, the brotherhood of God. And, and I mean, this is this is very, very uh, beautiful here. Let me see if I can plug this in right here. Because see a, a battery light indication. All right. Okay, we're good. We're good, all right? All right. All right. Um, so they were in, admitted along with, in the person of their elders, they were admitted to the fellowship of God. Exodus chapter 24, verses 9 to 11. Secondly, Musa, the head of the fraternal order of the Lewawi on the Levites, Musa, was then called up to Kabbalah, to Kabbalah, to receive, to Kabbalah, the Silat, or the, or the stone tablets, the hieroglyphic tablets of stone, Exodus uh, 24, verses 12 to 18. 
Now the story divides. The story then at this point divides, right? And what's the division? Well, Moses is in the mount, the the Sina Sina Terara. He's in Mount Sinai. He receives a Kabbalah's Kabbalah's the gracious instructions, the gracious Torah concerning the tabernacle, priesthood, and sacrifice. The tabernacle, priesthood, and sacrifice. Another trinity. You understand? Exodus chapter 25 to Exodus chapter 31. Meantime, and in the meanwhile, in Exodus chapter 32, the people the people, the lost sheeple, the sheeple people, right, led by Haron or Aaron, Musa's brother, they break the first commandment. They, they violate the first word, rather. They, they broke the first word, the first word, thereby breaking the commandment, because the commandment is one. It's not ten commandments, it's ten words, right? So they break the first word, of the commandment, Musa returning, when he returns now, comes down from Sinatarara, Mount uh, uh, Sinai, the Amba, you know, the, the, that Amba, like, it was like, it was like a Debradamo, it's like a flat top kind of um, mountain, like a close encounter sort of a mountain. Um, he returned now from the mountain, and seeing what, what went on, he breaks the tablets, he breaks the silat which were written with the finger, that was written with what? The finger, the tat, the tat of a gaziari here, of the sustainer, the tat, the finger. Well, some may say tohut, you might, might read that in there, but that's another level of study. Exodus chapter 31, verses 18, Exodus chapter 32, verses 16 to 19. And now the third portion of this is that the second silat, the second set of stone um, tablets were made, and the law or Torah, the Torah again was written by Musa. Again, it was written by now Moses. First, it was by Yod Hey Wow Hey, but now Musa wrote it. Cause Musa broke it. Musa wrote it in the presence of Yahweh in Exodus chapter thirty-four, verses one, verse twenty-eight, and verse. 29. Now, we just cover the footnote here, and, and there's a lot of verses that it, it, it references here. A very excellent work, brothers and sisters, um, is when you're studying, especially in the Schofield Study Bible, and you come across, say, a portion like this. Maybe you can't do it all in one sitting, you know, but since you already have this as an outline, go through, like, sentence by sentence. You know, like the, sometimes the sentence has a point, or point by point. Look it up. Write down these scriptures. Write down these verses, just like you're in class, just like you're studying. Remember, um, education doesn't just take place in the classroom. Education takes place even in the home, and especially where we're at. We need to devote that time, you understand, for our spiritual mind. You know, that's how we'll be able to overcome in this very perilous perilous time. So what we're going to do is put this on the side for a moment, right? And let's get to uh, Flora's, Flora's, um, the, the epistle to Flora. Now, as you said, we're referring to this. Now we're going to connect this. Remember, we went over this briefly, and you might have to rewind it or get a copy of the Schofield Study Bible or actually study in your Schofield Study Bible to really meditate on the details. You know, saying meditate on the details. Unfortunately, brothers and sisters, it's not the time to really go into each point as we would like to, because there's much to cover, Yovas, and we hope that you have the opportunity to cover this on your own. We pray that you do, and we pray that the Almighty gives you, in the name of Jesus Christos, a, a willingness of spirit, a desire of spirit to study it. Because when you have that will to do it, 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 it makes a good will and love and faith, it makes it much easier to do it. So, so pray for those things, you know. And ask Exiavia, ask the sustainer in the name of Jesus Christos to, to give you a heart and a mind to love his word and to seek his word 
especially if you might find that you don't, you're doing it, but just going through the motions. Pray. Pray and ask for what you want. Ask. He says you don't receive because you don't ask, but you ask amiss. You're not really truly asking according to his will. You're always, but pray. Pray and ask. So the meaning and the value of the Jewish Bible, it says in the contents, which Christians eventually called the Old Testament, was one of the burning issues faced by Christianity in the second century. At this time, more and more Christians came from a non-Jewish or non-Hebrew background, and Christian theologians began to measure themselves against the teachings of secular Hellenistic philosophy. Many branches of uh, Christina, which is known as Christianity, had to face this issue. The Gnostics, or the Awaki, because Bamarinya, Gnostic will be the word um, Awaki, or mature, mature or knowledgeable, knower, and it's used in the scripture, not as Gnostic, but the same meaning to know. The, so we'll say Awaki as well as Gnostics, but the Awaki watch no less than any other. The classic Awaki um, mishtir or myth and its um, Valentinian successor obviously expressed a massive revision of the cosmology and history taught in the book of Moses. So even in the first century Christianity, we see where the book of Moses and the Torah had an application among the early church and those who who had the had had the privilege to have a copy of 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 of, of the Torah. Remember, it wasn't like today where they have printing presses, but each Torah scroll had to be handwritten, and that was a very laborious and tedious work. So this is one reason why ones and ones went to like the the synagogue, you know, the mikorah because there a copy would be there, or a couple of copies, and one would be able to go there to study, like at a, like like uh, like a library. This is where the kind of idea for a library came from, the mikorah or the Hebraic um, synagogue, you know, where ones would go there to study certain scripture. But now we have the benefit of having these books for ourselves. We can purchase a copy, and we can, you know, read it in the privacy of our own home, you know, and, and that is, that's a blessing, but are we using the time, are we redeeming the time in recognition of how evil these days are, because this is like oil, studying the word is like getting oil in our lamp, so our light can and will keep burning, but other sources show that the Wakiwoch or the Gnostics and the Valentinians addressed also the problem of the Old Testament prophecies and their authenticity. Now it says to Valentian Gnostics, all these aspects of the Old Testament problem were systematically related for the Valentian myth of origins provided an interpretive key to all religious scripture, expression, practice, and belief. A presentation of Valentian Christianity might therefore begin at almost any point in the system. In the in, in Ptolemy's Epistle to Flora, the great Valentian teacher, one who is called Ptolemy, he chooses to begin a systematic course of instruction by starting with the question of religious laws and observances. By starting the question of religious laws and observances. His addressee is a female adherent of ordinary Christianity named Flora. So the one who he's addressing is like a sister from a, a regular church out there. And Valentian, um, this Valentian teacher, Potomi, he in a sense would represent I and I, you know, this new revelation of Rastafari, but in that time representing Christ. You understand? But Christ from that true rooted and grounded in the, the Torah, in the prophets, in the Psalms of David, those books that Christ reminded his ignorant disciples of, because they were ignorant of that. And he spent time reminding them how key and crucial it is to study the, the, the Old Testament scripture. 
So when we study it and want to say, oh, that's all that Jewish stuff, and so we say the Moshiach study it as, as a Christian. So why aren't, why aren't you, why aren't your church studying it? You know what I mean? Why you have half a Bible, you know, the New Testament in that sense, and you have no regard for the Old Testament. But his manner of presentation is elementary, using terms that are moral and non-metaphysical, or moral. So he was not preaching the mystical side of it, but he was preaching the moral and the non-metaphysical, using terms that wasn't uh, like too scientific, non-metaphysical, and almost entirely within the realm of conventional Christian language. For another example of element uh, elementary Valentine instruction, see, I think this is, um, see another document here, TRS, uh, which one is it? Um, TRS, let's just see which one, the teaching. Let's see. Um, give me one moment. T R. Okay. Let me look at the code, the key, because I, I, w I want you at least to get familiar with the name of it. Um, okay. T R. Oh, the treatise, the treatise on resurrection. There's another document. That's an excellent document. The treatise on resurrection, right, for more of that. Now, Potomi begins with a clear and careful analysis of the multiple authorship of the Old Testament laws. So Potomi, he breaks down to the sister, Sister Flora, um, the clear, you know, and clear and careful analytical um, observation and study of the multiple authorship of Old Testament laws characterizes the nature of the laws by comparing them with the teachings of Jesus, by comparing now the Old Testament with what Christ, Yeshua, Jesus taught, and from their nature draws conclusions about the God who legislated them. But Tomi's conclusions take him to the very edge of metaphysics and myth which he promises will form the next lesson of his course. For a summary of Potomi's metaphysics, um, I think C. Arrhenius on Potomi, um, his next lesson to Flora does not seem to have survived. In other words, it wasn't one of the documents, unfortunately, that survived. One can distinguish, Potomi concludes, a perfect God who is good, the God of Israel, the Tobia, or Tobia, the Tobja, the Tobija, the Good Ja, and the Old Testament, who is just, and the Diablos, the devil who is Kufu, evil. He carefully contrasts this view with positions that assert only two principles. He asserts two principles, God and the devil. In comparison with the theology of, um, let's get this, they have this in code again, with the theology of, of what's these other documents? The theology of, um, let's see, which one is this? Uh, all right, the theology of, all right, um, B J N B J N um, is T S B A J T S B A J. I don't see anything with T S T S B A J T S. Okay, when it comes to I and I, I'll, I'll point it out. And there's another one, um, R A D. R A D the revelation of Adam is another revelation of Adam. Um, all right. Um, it says Potomi's tripartite scheme shows shows um, a relatively positive attitude toward the craftsmen of the world or the God of Israel. Some classic Gnostic scriptures also follow the same tripartite scheme. In the opening of the epistle, Potomi sets out to refute two other opinions on the source of the Old Testament law. One opinion 
identify the legislator with the highest God. This was the view of ordinary Christianity and a great part of Judaism. The other identified the legislator with the devil. Scholars have been uncertain about the source of this opinion, but it may refer to Gnostics who follow a myth like that of um, uh, BJN of, S, of John and the revelation of Adam, where the craftsman of the world, or Yaudabaoth, appears to be identical with the God of, of Israel. Now, let me just give you a little, a little bit of background on this. Um, and let's, let's get into this. Let's get into this because the text is known only from a word-for-word -word quotation uh, in the, from the 4th century. Okay, here we go. Now, he says in the prologue, first session, difficulty of the topic. There's a difficulty, there's a certain difficulty in this particular topic. When we're talking about the law, the Torah, and the connection with Christ and and understanding what is what. And, and now Paul has a very good um, Paul, Hawadiah Paul in the New Testament. We understand where, what Peter said when Peter said that um, the wisdom of Paul by some is misunderstood because Paul was a Gnostic. Paul was a Gnostic Christian. He was a he was definitely mature Awaki. He was not one of the Alawaki. He was not one of the ignorant. He was he was definitely a Noah. And many things in Paul do get twisted even by many Christians today. And there are even some Christians who view Paul as an Antichrist, and yes, there are some who say they are either Christian or Jews or whatever like that. And Dr. York was of such an opinion as well. And from a Gentile Western misunderstanding, I could understand how one can come to that conclusion. You see, because you need the the, the correct faith or the Ritua Hymenot, what we call the Ethiopic faith or a faith which is correct as the Ethiopic faith to really understand these things. This is why um, Peter says in his second letter, he says, he speaks about um, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord, our Donenu, is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given to him, hath written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, like they wrestle with it, as or they twist it, as they do also the other scriptures to their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, Beware, be aware, lest ye, you all also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge. So we have grace, but we also must grow in the knowledge. So many say they have grace and they, and they rely on the grace and they, and they often invoke the grace, but what they don't know with the, without the knowledge you fall from grace, and many are falling for gra from grace, and that is the great apostasy that we are witnessing at the end of this church age. But Peter instructs grow, growth in grace, not, not a stagnation in grace, but a growing in grace, and in the knowledge, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and and forever. Amen. So we point that out right there because there, uh, Peter, in Peter's epistle, there's an acknowledgement that Hawari Apollos had a particular wisdom. You see, and when we are able to understand in its proper aspect, for lack of a better word, this was the, the epinostikoi, or what is commonly called the Gnostic not the su gnosis pseudonymos, not falsely called science, 
That's what the world believes today is the false science, the false knowing. But what Paul, who already Apollos had, and what even um, Potomi has here is the true knowledge. And let's get into this. So both there it speaks about some things that are hard to be understood. Here in Potomi's letter or epistle to Flora, it has a, sub, a subtitle and says difficulty of the topic. The subject matter is difficult. The law established by Moses, my dear sister Flora, has in the past been misunderstood by many people, for they were not closely acquainted with the one who established it or with its commandments. I think you will see this at once if you study their discordant opinions on this topic. So in this um. This is one line. This is a, a rather like a paragraphical line. But he says something very interesting. He says that the law that was established by Moses, my dear sister Flora, has in the past been misunderstood by many people. In other words, what's called, often called the Ten Commandments have been misunderstood. We've been teaching that. It's not Ten Commandments. It's one commandment. It's ten words. That's what they call a decalogue. You understand? It's ten words. For they were not closely acquainted. They, were, they had a general idea, but not a very close acquaintance with the one who established it or with its commandments. They really didn't understand the commandments. And he says to Flora, you're going to see this for yourself if you study their discordant opinions on this topic. If you look at, well, this one says this. Like if you look at the, all the different so-called pseudo-churches um, out there, all the demon nomination, denominations out there, and you look at, well, what is your opinion, you understand, about this or that, and then go to the next one, and go to the next one, go to the next one. You're going to find a lot of these same sort of, sort of discordant. There's no harmony of opinion. It's discordant. You understand? Now, the next section is false opinions on the topic. For some say that this law has been ordained by God the Father while others following the opposite course stoutly contend that it has been established by the adversary or ha shatan or satan the pernicious devil diablos and so the latter school the latter school he used the word school or school of thought attributes the craftsmanship the, the the masonry or the building the craftsmanship of the world the grand architect architect ship of the world to Diablos, saying that he is, quote, the father and maker of the universe, end quote. But they are utterly in error. They are utterly in error. They disagree with one another, and each of the schools utterly misses the truth of the matter. So some say that the, the commandments and Old Testament, you know, they try to say the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah, was a wrathful and an evil God and the devil. Those of that opinion are wrong. You understand? And he makes a good point right here concerning the false opinions on the topic. The next section, the law not established by the perfect God. Now that is interesting there. What does this mean? The law was not established by the perfect God. Let's, let's hear what he says. Now, it does not seem that the law was established by the perfect God and Father, for it must be of the same character as its giver, and yet it is imperfect and needful of being fulfilled by another and contains commandments incongruous with the nature and intentions of such a God. So now he says the law... It does seem to be said by the perfect God. Now, he, he goes on in the next section, nor by the devil. So it was not established by the perfect God, nor by the devil. He says, on the other hand, to attribute a law that abolishes injustice to the injustice of the adversary is the false logic or logical fallacy of those who do not comprehend the principle of which the Savior spoke. 
For our Savior declared that a house or a city divided against itself would not be able to stand. And further, the apostle states that the craftsmanship of the world is his, and that, quote, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made. And that's from um, John 1 and um, 1 and 3 and Matthew 12 and 25. Thus anticipating these liars, thus anticipating these liars' flimsy, their flimsy wisdom. And the craftsmanship is that of a God who is just and hates evil, not a pernicious one as believed by these thoughtless people who take no account of the craftsman's forethought and are so and so are blind not only in the eye of the soul but even in the eyes of the body. The creator's forethought is evident in the orderly and providential workings of the natural world, which can be seen with even the eye, or the oina shigawi. Now, here's the topic. Now, from what has been said, it should be clear to you that these schools of thought utterly miss the truth, though each does so in its own peculiar way. One school by not being acquainted with the God of righteousness, the other by not being acquainted with the Father of the entirety, who was manifested by him alone who came and who alone knew him. It remains for us who have been deemed worthy of acquaintance with both to show you exactly what sort of law the law is and which legislator established it. We shall offer proofs of what we say by drawing from our Savior's words, by which alone it is possible to reach a certain apprehension of the reality of the matter without stumbling. Now, that's the prologue section. Now, this is, this is a fairly... This is not a long book. We might not have um, the ability to go through everything in this, but let's continue with his, his uh, ficare or his exposition, the nature of the law, the nature of the law, the three divisions of the law, multiple authorship of the law. I found this to be extremely, extremely interesting in comparison to what we just read at the footnote of Exodus chapter 20. Because it says, Now, First, you must learn that, as a whole, the law contained in the Pentateuch of Moses or the five books of Moses was not established by a single author. I mean, not by God, Ha Elohim, alone. Rather, there are certain of its commandments that were established by human beings as well. Indeed, our Savior's words teach us that the Pentateuch, or the Orit, or the Torah, divides into three parts. So that's three now. You see how many times the, the Trinity is bearing witness, even in his work, is bearing witness to saying that the Pentateuch, it divides into three parts. For one division belongs to God himself and his legislation while another division belongs to Moses. Indeed, Moses ordained certain of the commandments not as God himself ordained through him, rather based upon his own thoughts about the matter. And yet a third division belongs to the elders of the people, who likewise in the beginning must have inserted certain of their own commandments. You will now learn how all this can be demonstrated from the Savior's words. And I found this to be interesting because this is in a book of Gnostics. And now, 
all Gnostics are not the same Gnostics. Let me just say that right up front. You understand? And what is interesting, when we read and study um, Potomac's epistle to Flora, he points that out. He points out that there are different schools of thought. And these different schools of thought, they all differ from one another. But when we look at the Savior's words and we study the matter, then we can get a true comprehension of this. And this is the, it's interesting because this is the second century. This is second, early Christianity, second century Christianity. And in a sense, it, it, it echoes what a lot of us have, through much diligence and prayer, and study been learning for ourselves. So this is a beautiful witness of early Christianity right here. And even the fact that this is how Christians were concerned about the truth, not just about so-called pseudo-praise and worship and singing a bunch of songs and, 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 and dressed up like, like crazy Gentiles or whatever, and, and not interested in that, but really in teaching and, and, and learning of the Savior. You understand? And learning of the Savior, not a bunch of song and dance, but in that knowledge of the Bain Ha Elohim, that knowledge of the Son of God. Now, here is a section, legislation of God distinct from legislation of Moses. When the Savior was talking with those who were arguing with him about divorce, and it had been ordained in the law, that divorce is permitted. He said to them, For your hardness of heart, Musa, allowed divorce of one's wife. Now from the beginning it was not so. For God, he says, has joined together this union, and, quote, what the Lord has joined together let no man put asunder, end quote. Here he shows that the law of God is one thing forbidding a woman to be put asunder from her husband, while the law of Moses is another, permitting the couple to be put asunder because of hard-heartedness. And so, accordingly, Musa ordains contrary to what God, Ha Elohim, ordains for separating is contrary to not separating. Yet, if we also scrutinize Moses' intentions with which he ordained this commandment, we find that he created the commandment not of his own inclination, but of necessity because of the weakness to whom it was ordained. For the latter were not able to put into practice God's intentions. That's what the Old Testament basically shows you. They were not able to put into what practice and therefore perfect God's intentions in the matter of their not being permitted to divorce their wives. Some of them were on very bad terms with their wives and ran the risk of being further diverted into injustice and from there into their destruction. Musa, Moses wishing to excise or cut out this unpleasant element through which they also ran the risk of being destroyed. They ran the risk, you know, it's the, the family breakdown. It's like the same issues that we have today. You know, the family issues, man, black man, black woman, black family, and children, and, and the community issue, and the social issues. You know, so Musa, he, he, he desired, he wished to exercise, to cut this unpleasant element through which they also ran the risk of being destroyed, ordained for them of his own accord a second law, the law of divorce choosing under the circumstances the lesser of two evils, as it were, so that if they were unable to keep the former, that is, God's pure law, God's law, Ha Elohim's law, they could keep 
at least the latter, and so not be diverted into, be diverted into injustice and evil, through which utter destruction would follow in consequence. And that's what Satan wanted. Because he, he understood what the intention of the Beit Israel was to bring about the Moshiach. So he focused on the Beit Israel, Satan and, and, and the, the fallen angels and, and the demons and, and the evil people focused on the Beit Israel like they focus on black people today. Because it's through black people, you understand this? Through that black seed that the Messiah will come. This is why the only antichrist project that truly can be considered an antichrist agenda was to stop the rise of the black messiah and that's COINTEL pro from the 60s and it's still ongoing it's still ongoing it's an antichrist agenda but we see right here that there are moses intentions with with which we find him ordaining laws that are contrary to those of God. At any rate, even if we have for a moment used only one example in our proof, it is beyond doubt, as we have shown, this law is of Moses himself and is distinct from God's. Now, before we even move, um, before we even move uh, forward. It's Im important to understand what Potomi is explaining to um, Sister Flora here in this epistle. And, 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 you know, once you get it, you figure, like, how come I didn't already know it? You know, because it's like, great, it's so plain to see, but many don't see it. Like, like the, the writer says, they are not closely acquainted with this. But then he says, there's a traditional legislation of the elders. Now, we know that there was, there was God, Ha Elohim, there was Moses and Adam, and then there was the elders. And it's interesting, this um, tripartite, almost government. Now, there was the elders now, and their traditional, because there were some traditions of the elders, you know, um, how cultures keep certain traditions, you understand, um, certain practices which were traditional, you know. Um, and the Savior shows also that there are some traditions of the elders interwoven in the law. So in the law, there's some things which were the traditions of people of old time, in other words, that was woven in the law. And Yeshua says, he says, for God spoke, Honor your father and your mother that it may be well with you. But you have declared, the Savior says, addressing the elders, what you would have gained from me is given to God. And for the sake of your tradition, O ancients, you have made the law of, you have made void the law of Ha Elohim. And Isaiah, Yeshayahu, he declared this by saying, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines, as teachings, what are really the precepts of men, not teaching scripture, scripture, and, 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 and that which concerns scripture, but teaching what, what men say, not what John say. Thus, it will be clearly shown from these passages that as a whole, the law is divided into three parts. For we have found in it legislations belonging to Musa himself, to the elders, and to God, or Jah, himself. Moreover, the analysis of the law as a whole, as we have divided it here, has made clear which part of it is genuine. Then he speaks on the three subdivisions of God's own law. Now, what is more, the one part that is the law of God himself divides into three subdivisions. So we have the three 
inputs into over as a whole the law. We have from from Jah, from God, we have from Moses and the elders. Then when we go to the part that is from Jah himself or God himself, there are three parts to that part. Or three subdivisions. The nature of the subdivisions. Pure but imperfect. The first subdivision is the pure legislation, not interwoven with evil, which alone is properly called law, and which the Savior did not come to abolish but to fulfill. And this is where we speak on the, the ten words or the Decalogue, often called the Ten Commandments. For what he fulfilled was not alien to him, was not alien to his nature, his bahari, but stood in need of fulfillment. It stood in need of one's fulfilling it and showing that example. For it did not have perfection. See, it did not have that it was not. See, that's the key thing. It did not have perfection in the sense that it was not fulfilled. It needed to be fulfilled. Secondly, interwoven with injustice. The second subdivision is part interwoven with the inferior and with injustice. It's, it's interwoven with that which is inferior and interwoven with injustice, which the Savior abolished as being incongruous with his own bahari, with his own nature, which is the nature of his Father, our Father, his God, our God. Thirdly, symbolic. Finally, the third subdivision is the symbolic and allegorical part, which, or like I say sometimes, verbal hieroglyphic is, is symbolical, proverbial, parabolical, which is after the image, after the image of the superior or the spiritual realm, but is put in symbolic language. The Savior changed the referent of this part from the perceptible, visible level to the spiritual or the invisible one. So we have Yamitai, Yamatai. Now the Decalogue is pure, he says, but imperfect. The ten words. The first, the law of God is that is pure and not interwoven with the inferior is the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, literally the ten words inscribed on two stone tablets. They divide into the prohibition of things that must be avoided and the commanding of things that must be done. Although they contain pure legislation, they do not have perfection, and so they were in need of fulfillment by the Savior. In other words, they were in need of a, a, a perfect type, a perfect example, an exemplary, an example needed to be made so that it would have perfection and so that we would, through faith on Yeshua HaMoshiach, be able to fulfill that. Now he goes on to the text, the lex talionis is interwoven with injustice. The second, which is interwoven with injustice, that is that which applies to retaliation and repayment of those who have already committed a wrong, commanding us to pluck out an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and to retaliate for murder with murder. This part is interwoven with injustice. For the one who is second to act unjustly still acts unjustly, differing only in the relative order in which he acts and committing the very same act. But otherwise, this commandment both was and is just. Do you understand that right there? It is interwoven with a sense of injustice, However, the commandment was and is just having been established as a 
deviation from the pure law because of the weakness of those to whom it was ordained. Yet it is incongruous with the nature and the goodness of the father of Abba, of Abba Kedus, the father of entirety. Now, perhaps this was apt. In other words, this was appropriate to say. But even more, it was a result of necessity. It was needful. You know, I mean, I mean, there was a crisis. There was a social crisis. It's like among our people, our lost sheep, right now. There's a social crisis in in the earth. There's a there's a moral crisis now. Perhaps this was apt, but even more, it was a result of necessity. For when one who does not wish even a single murder to occur by saying, "Ye shall not murder or kill." When I say he ordains a second law that commands the murderer to be murdered, acting as judge between two murderers, he who forbade even a single murder has, without realizing it, been cheated by necessity. For this reason, then, the son, Ben Ha Elohim, Yeshua, who was sent from him, the Abba, abolished this part of the law, though he admits that it to belong, is to belong to Ha Elohim. This is part, I mean, this part is reckoned as belonging to the old school. This is what's known as the old school of thought. Both where he says, for God spoke, he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him surely die. Matthew 15 and 4 and, and elsewhere. One more part of this. I hope we still have a little bit of time on this. One more part of this because here's where Potomac's epistle to Flora, second century Christian Gnostic epistle, speaks now of the ritual law has become symbolic. How has the ritual law become symbolic? Well, let's read. And the third subdivision of God's law is the, is the symbolical part, which is after the image of the superior or the spiritual realm, the spiritual world, the Samayat, the spiritual world, Mensasawi Alam. I mean, what is ordained about offerings, circumcision, the Sabbath, fasting, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the like. Now, once the truth has been manifest, the referent of all these ordinances was changed inasmuch as they are images and allegories as to their meaning in the visible realm and their physical accomplishment they were abolished, but as to their spiritual meaning they were elevated with the words remaining the same but the subject matter being altered. For the Savior, Medane, Medhane Alem, commanded us to offer offerings, but not dumb beasts or incense, rather spiritual praises and glorifications and prayers of thanksgiving of Mizgana, Mizgana Yilalu, and offerings in the form of sharing and good deeds. And he wishes us to perform circumcision, but not circumcision only of the bodily foreskin, rather of the spiritual heart, and to keep the Sabbath, for he wants us to be inactive in wicked acts, and to fast, though he does not wish us to perform physical fasts, rather spiritual ones, which consist of abstinence from all bad deeds.
Now, on that point about fasting, it's very important because now we're in, as of February uh, 20th, February 20th, 2012, we're in that that 40-plus day um, fast before Fasica, before Pass or Pesach, which is known in the world as, quote, Easter. You understand? And um, the point about fasting here is appropriate. The justification for fasting. Nevertheless, fasting as to the visible realm is observed by our adherents. Since fasting, if practiced with reason, can contribute something to the soul. So long as it does not take place in imitation of other people or by habit or because fasting has been prescribed for a particular day. Likewise, it is observed in memory of true fasting so that those who are not yet able to observe true fasting might have a remembrance of it from fasting according to the visible realm. Likewise, the Apostle Paulos, Hawaria Paulos, the Apostle Paul, makes it clear that Passover, Fasica, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were images. They were like visuals, images. For he says that Christos, Fasicachina, Tardoalina, Christ, our Paschal Lamb, our Passover lamb, our Pascha lamb has been sacrificed. And he says, be without leaven, having no share in leaven. Now, by leaven, he means evil, but rather be fresh dough, be fresh dough. And we're going to pause this right here for a moment because... It has a little bit more, but we're, we're, we're a little more than halfway through this. But we just pause this right here at the justification for fasting because it, it, it's, 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 it's interesting how this connects with understanding the Torah. Understanding the Torah and understanding this particular area of the Torah um, portion concerning the Decalogue or the Ten Words, as well as how early Christians, it's obviously he quoted from Isaiah, he quoted from Old Testament, he quoted from New Testament. So this means that they, they had the Scripture, and they regarded the Scriptures very highly, even though each individual did not have their own personal copy. So what would people do? People would commit it to their head and their heart. Unfortunately, now we have ability to have many copies, have it on our computer, you understand, um, have an app for that and everything. But still, we don't have it in our head and our hearts. Brothers and sisters, I would encourage and advise you in your studies to try as possible, like we said, to journal your studies, to write down the verses, you know, verses of your study, because it's an old uh, Hebraic, and among some of the Jews, they still... Um, um, the Rebbe's they 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 keep this um, as a um, as a kind of a principle that one is one cannot even discuss or or a, a particular portion of scripture unless they unless they have they can commit it to their memory. In other words, if you if you have not have not learned it by heart, it, it's kind of a waste of time really arguing for one because somebody just read something and they have a, 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 a kind of a, 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 a fake a fake idea. You know, you know, like you might read something and it might not seem right, but you didn't really study it. You didn't really commit it. You you, you didn't really you can't even quote it, you know? And I wanna point that out about, you know, learning the scripture by heart, you know, um, means to be able to 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 quote it, you know what I'm saying? To be able to, and, and when you just practice with that, it, it does something amazing to really open up a receptivity in your heart and your mind. Brothers and sisters, I love you. Um, 
it might be a little bit long-winded on this particular study. Um, I hope you're able to uh, understand what our point was and, and is on this particular area in, in, in the in the 18th, 17th, and 18th um, um, Torah portion. And, and we're, we're focusing mainly on the commandments, but mainly on the law, getting a better understanding and comprehension of the law, you know, the different parts of the law, you know, who legislated the law, which part is that pure law, you, you know, because these things were understood in its time. But now when, even when they say the law was done away with, Many people don't know which law it is speaking of that Christ abolished and did away with. That particular reading and study, you know, it gives us um, the uh, confirmation what we already knew, that it wasn't the pure law or God's pure will, his righteous will, contained in the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, but it was those other aspects of the law that out of necessity were there so that the people were not diverted into injustice and gross evil which would lead to destruction but eventually even those um, legislations did not prevent um, the captivity and scattering of Beta Israel so we also have to be very conscious of that we got into this because of disobedience. We can only come out of this with obedience. So my brothers and sisters, I love you. And may the grace of Jesus Christos, the glory of Kedamawi Ali Selassie be with you and within you until we meet and reason again. We say Shalom, Rastafari, and moreover, Barhan, and Na Salam.